side of, uh, of, of sci-fi, has that diminished your love of science fiction and all the all the things you're a fan of in any way? What's that being? As being, you know, I mean, well, is you know, it's 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 canon. It's it's there with with Alien with Star Wars. I'd put it up against Ender's Game. So does being a part of the party in that way and having a perspective with all the people who aren't Steven Salian you've, you've had conversations with, does that diminish your fandom in any way or does it strengthen it or does it remain the same as it ever was? It, I, to me, it feels the same because I don't uh, think of, um, I don't think of wool in that same way. I'm still shocked I, when I go into bookstores and it's still there. And I've had people explain to me like, this is one of those perennial books now that's like, um, and I, I can't even put it in this. I, I'd hate saying this, but other people have told me this. It's like, this is like Dune. And they say it because Dune's usually shelved right near me. Herbert and Howie are like, close enough. But they're like, if you go to a bookstore in 30 years, there'll be like one copy of Wool on the shelf just in case. And that's bizarre to me because I worked in bookstores forever. And books lasted six months. That's the only chance they got. So I... I'm blown away by that, but by the, the fact that this might be one of those perennial books that just kind of hangs around, it's a huge honor. But uh, yeah, for some reason, it just doesn't, doesn't feel real to me at all. It, it, it's that uh, imposter syndrome. It feels like at any moment it could all disappear and be taken away. So um, I, I, I still feel like the same fan that I've always been towards this stuff. And sometimes I see what's happening with my stuff and it just i feel like i'm an observer like it's happening to somebody else does it at least give you confident when you sit down and draft something new that hey here here's hugh howie author of wool for sure accomplished this much or does it fill you with more anxiety because will this be as good as uh whatever the last thing was um i would say probably more anxiety but i i, I don't think anything will ever have the effect that wool had so i don't i don't try to replicate that or or, or try to achieve that i you know I, my best writing happens when i'm writing for myself and that's the mind space i get in which is why i don't publish a lot of the stuff that i write now like i'm just f having fun and writing for the pleasure and, and things just sit on my hard drive and i go back and toy with it but there's uh i don't have that uh impulse to like make everything available anymore what uh what changed do you think I don't know. You know, I was at a, I was at a, um, a book, uh, a BEA. What do they? What's that stand for? Book uh, Expo of America or something? Yeah, the, the, yeah the big, the, uh, big BEA event in New York at the Javits Center, and um, I was part of a, uh, a, a group of self-published authors who had all had a certain amount of success, and we got a booth together there, which had never been done before. Um, uh, because they're not cheap and, you know, authors just don't do that. They don't spend that kind of money on, on promotion. So we were getting some interest from people. They're really shocked that, that here was a group of authors who were all having success publishing. And at the time, I didn't even qualify to be in the booth with these other authors. Um, uh, they, as I was in some ways the biggest name there because of some of the media coverage I'd gotten, but I was making less money than they were because they were mostly romance writers and they were killing it. And, uh, everyone there had sold like millions of books and made millions of dollars. And I think their criteria to, to put this thing together were people that had made a certain amount of money with publishing. And then they realized that no male author qualified and they needed some diversity. So I was their diversity hire. <laughs> they were like, we, we need a guy, like who will do it? And I was friends with a couple of them. And they're like, Hugh, will you do this? I was like, sure. And then I found out later, I, I would, I, you know, it was like, um, getting into college because like you are, you know, the, the uh, ethnicities that they want to like check the box. Like that's what happened to me. I, I basically was reverse discriminated against. So I would take it any leg up I can get as a white man, like whatever advantage I can get in this world because they don't come often. <laughs> um, so I, I'm in that, this That booth. was that tongue in cheek for anybody that's clipping. That was, that was sarcasm. <laughs> I um, so, uh, but I, I was standing there with this person, um, uh, this this writing couple, right under the name uh, Jacinda Wilder, and dear friends, and and they had were going to miss their mortgage payment um, when a book of theirs, their first one that took off, they've been writing and, and working really hard for a long time, and there were so many times they should have given up. 
and they were not sure how they were going to make their mortgage payment. They had kids and all kinds of stuff going on, and their book took off, and it made enough money this month, this one month, to make that payment, and then from there, their career just took off. And their story to me was one of the most amazing things in publishing, and no one was really covering it. And I was standing in, in this booth, and like uh, a TV producer came up with their cameras, and they were going to do this big like interview with me. And I had nothing to, to say that was more incredible than this story that was beside me. And this was something that I knew was going on in the publishing world at the time. I was collecting accounts and stories from other writers that were having amazing things happening to them. And... And I couldn't believe how many of these stories were just unknown. And so I remember at the time just saying, like, uh, just think about their story versus what they, the answers they wanted uh, out of me, this, this interview. And I was like, let me tell you what you guys should do. You should do a story on these guys because what they're doing is unbelievable. You won't believe the, the coincidences and the success. It'll make, uh, it'll make you cry. Uh, if I tell you my story, you'll cry from boredom. And the cameras turned onto um, the couple that write us, Jacinda Wilder. And um, and I remember thinking, like, that was, uh, they, they took a one for me, because I didn't have to do the, the interview. The, the, the story was much better than it would have been if it was about me. But I realized that any time that, uh, I've had so much luck and so much time in the sun, any time I can deflect and say, there's so much going on out there. There's so many great, stories to read, so much to do. Um, so uh, I guess by not publishing everything that I write, it's also my way of saying like, there's just better books out there to read. I get people out, when they find out I'm a writer, they say, well, what should I read? And I'm like, I start naming all my favorite books. None of them are mine. And they're like, no, what of yours should I read? And honestly, I just can't suggest over other people's stuff, like something of mine anymore. I feel like I've been too lucky. The Universe needs to balance out. Everyone else needs to get their due. And then maybe you can come back around to me once everyone else has had a lap. And I feel that. I, I've lived and breathed that for years now. And it's, I've gotten more enjoyment out of trying to elevate other people than promoting my own stuff. That is one of my, uh, I promise, I, I, I took a pledge not to get too butt kissy. But that is one of my favorite things about you is consistently over the years, your whatever you're writing, whatever you're talking about, it's always going to be turned around and reflected, if not on somebody you know, on the person listening, on on people that you can inspire to go and do, if not re replicate your your success, to have a version of success that's going to fulfill them and, and and make them happy. Are you comfortable with the level of fame that you've achieved? I would love to have your readership. I don't know that I would want <laughs> fame. That looks like a lot. I, I it doesn't. You know, it's really weird because. Uh... It's a dumb, it's it's not a good thing that we don't have as many people reading as we do watching TV and um, watching films. So you can be like kind of a big deal in a small community, but you're, it doesn't make you a big deal. Like I, um, you know, I've maybe three times in this last year, I've had someone recognize me out on the street. Um, that's like less than the number of times I bump into people that I know just walking around New York who are friends, you know? So it's not, I don't feel any kind of, um, are you in the or fame. <laughs> no, like, but, but no one, no one knows what any writers look like. Like I would, I would only recognize a handful of writers and I'm a big time reader. It's just, it's the best kind of fame to have. If you go to a book conference, everyone knows who you are because that's the community of people that follow these things. Um, whether they don't might not recognize your face, but they know your name, they read your badge. I'm like, oh, I know what you've written, or I've, I've read an interview with you. But um, and the general public, like authors, are just completely anonymous. Worldwide, maybe I've sold a like I don't know three to five million copies or something. That's like almost nothing. And um, when it comes to the pop, you know general population, I mean it's everything. But when you have aspirations of being a writer and hoping to get 10 people to read your book. Um, so I don't feel famous at all, like at all. And I'm always in shock when uh, when we were in Portugal, we were sitting at a restaurant and I start talking to someone like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm a writer. And so I moved here. I'm like, oh, my God, what do you write? And she's talking about all of her writing and publishing or just geeking out about stuff. And and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, ah, I, used to, I used to be a writer, too. And then um, 
my girlfriend was like, yeah, it's like Hugh Howie, he wrote Wool. And she's like freaking out, like, oh, my God, I loved Wool. And and so when that kind of stuff happens, it still shocks me. I'm like, holy shit, you've read my book? Like, it just seems weird to me. So I guess, I don't know. I'm, I just don't, Nine yeah, years I'm, later with yeah, a, with a absolutely. contract and how many, what, I think it was over 15,000 reviews on, on Amazon. I guarantee most of the people watching this uh, have never heard of me. You know, they're coming on and they're like looking for the next author that you're interviewing and they're like, who's this guy? And I love that. I think it's, I'm more comfortable that way than I would be uh, any other way. So well, that makes perfect sense to me. I, I would be far more comfortable that way. I am far more comfortable not being famous, but it surprises me that uh, I, I would think that you, you must be like hounded by people like women throwing underwear at you. <laughs> Hugh Howie, oh my God. <laughs> no, I, live in, I live in Chelsea, man. If anything, it'd be men throwing their underwear at me. <laughs> That's true.